Hi everyone, welcome back to the episode of Ask Dr. Nick. My name is Dr. Nick Schmidlkoffer and I work for the Neurologic Wellness Institute. And on today's episode, our question is, what is dysautonomia? And this is a huge topic, um, not only in the current world today, but just in general. Um, we have been seeing more dysautonomia patients um, over the last three to five years uh, than any other time. And so I wanna discuss just what are the basic, what, what is dysautonomia, why is, what's the term? Um, what is the autonomic nervous system? What are the causes of dysautonomia? What is the main form of dysautonomia? Um, and so on and so forth. So to start, um, we're gonna say dysautonomia is just this big umbrella term for dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system. So there are many conditions that can be related to dysautonomia. Uh, the most common one is POTS, or postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Basically, when an individual goes or basically changes postures from laying down to standing, their heart rate elevates greatly, um, and it might cause neck pain, headaches, dizziness or lightheadedness, possibly fainting or like syncope. Um, and so that is the, the main form of dysautonomia. But dysautonomia can cause any changes in heart rate, uh, it can be tachycardia, so increased heart rate, bradycardia, decreased heart rate. It could um, cause changes in blood pressure, um, where blood changes in blood pressure could cause headaches. It could cause migraines if it's differently on one side of the body versus the other. Um, and it could lead to things like gut issues or digestion issues. It could cause constipation, diarrhea. It could predispose people to IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, or... IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, like different autoimmunities, uh, Crohn's, uh, ulcerative colitis, those types of things. Um, so dysautonomia is just this, again, very big umbrella term for dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system. Uh, and like I said, there are many causes. So we're just gonna go and we're gonna look at the Dysautonomia International page and just look at a, a good image that they have of what the autonomic system looks like. Um, and then another picture from an article as well looking at causes of POTS. So if we go to the Dysautonomia International page here, um, what is dysautonomia? So again, dysautonomia is this umbrella term um, and it is not necessarily rare. Over 70 million people worldwide live with some form of dysautonomia. It can affect any age, any gender. Um, there are again, many causes. Um, so people living with various forms of dysautonomia may have trouble regulating systems of the autonomic nervous system, which can lead to lightheadedness, fainting, unstable blood pressure, abnormal heart rates, malnutrition, and in severe cases, death. Um, so if we click this and we look to enlarge this picture of the autonomic nervous system, this gives us a good idea of everything that our brain, specifically the autonomic nervous system, is going to regulate. And so, if you look at the center of the picture, right, we have our brain, we have our big brain, which is more of the voluntary movement or perception. We have deeper in the brain, a reptilian brain, which maybe deals with anger and emotions. And then really deep in our brainstem, we have a lot of these initial structures that are dealing with our autonomic nervous system. Not to say that any other structure doesn't involve input into the autonomic nervous system. But if we go straight down through the brainstem here and the spinal cord all the way to the end of the spinal cord, um, we are going to have areas that govern the autonomic nervous system. There are two branches, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. The sympathetic is our fight or flight nervous system. Our fight or flight nervous system is going to arouse us to get us to run away from a bear, to uh, work through stress or stressors. Um, it is the part of the brain that probably should be off 90% of the time throughout our day, but in our modern world, a lot of people have the sympathetic nervous system on and active multiple times throughout the day, uh, whether it's through working, through stress, through trying to pick up kids, whatever that may be. And so then we have the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the rest and digest nervous system, or the part that should be active while we're resting, relaxing, um, and of course digesting our food because in order to digest our food and get the proper nutrients, we need our parasympathetic nervous system working functionally or optimally to um, get the necessary enzymes, release enzymes, um, and have good movement through our digestive system 
um, without without slowing or too fast because slowing can cause constipation too fast and cause diarrhea um, so if we look at the sympathetic aspect um, the fight or flight nervous system can cause it's mostly coming from um, the spinal cord on the on the last branch of the nervous system um, but it does start high up in the midbrain of the brainstem and so things like the sympathetic nervous system is going to dilate pupils it's going to prevent salivation um, it's going to improve uh, your lung capacity it inhibits digestion it stimulates release of glucose from the liver so that when you are running away from the bear you can make more glucose to have the energy to run but again we're not really digesting foods at that time um, and we need again that lung capacity good so when we're running away we can um, we can breathe more and get more oxygen um, it stimulates epinephrine norepinephrine release to again increase our heart rate and blood pressure um, it relaxes the bladder um, it contracts the rectum so it prevents or basically causes constipation um, and in the ejaculation or orgasm phase it is going to um, basically activate or cause the ejaculation or orgasm phase um, during sexual intercourse um, and then peripherally in the blood in the blood uh, or in the blood vessels sorry there is going to be constriction of the blood vessels and constriction of the blood vessels causes that increased heart rate generally okay so that's what the sympathetic nervous system does um, in dysautonomia sometimes some parts of the sympathetic nervous system are overactivated while some are underactivated same thing with the parasympathetic nervous system sometimes they're underactive sometimes they're overactive so in the parasympathetic state um, it, the, our pupils are going to constrict we're going to stimulate things for digestion so salivation um, digestion there stimulate the gallbladder to release uh, bile to digest fats um, we're not going to be running away from the bear so we don't need a lot of lung capacity our heart rate decreases because again we don't need a lot of blood moving around fast to support our muscles running away from that bear um, it relaxes the rectum um, contracts the bladder to push out urine when we need to urinate um, and then it causes the um, erection and vaginal lubrication phase of sexual intercourse um, prior to obviously the the orgasm and then peripherally we're going to have more vasodilation so we're getting more blood flow to all of the areas uh, in our body just but it's gonna be slower right because we have a decreased heart rate okay so we have all of these things that the autonomic nervous system governs things that we don't normally even think about but when dysautonomia happens these areas are unregulated there's an imbalance between the sympathetic and parasympathetic at possibly each one of these stages or multiple of these stages and this imbalance is what is provoking symptoms it's not efficient for the brain to be uh, having a problems with the brainstem having problems with these lower level areas that should be automatic uh, not even thinking about and instead we use parts of our big brain to have to control or have to take over for these relatively simple automatic movements simple automatic um, control auto autonomic regulation that is happening and so if we have poor autonomic nervous system then we're going to have basically inefficiency in our brain and that causes more symptoms again of lightheadedness headaches nausea um, digestion issues constipation diarrhea the, the it's it's very far a limit okay so again there are many causes of dysautonomia um, whether the first one to me that I always think about are head injuries concussions can definitely cause dysautonomia but also infections um, post viral infections whether that be like mono EBV um, Lyme disease mold infections or chronic mold can cause can cause uh, dysautonomia and then um, possibly many other variety of things um, including people that have genetic predisposition for dysautonomia so that's what I want to go to next so here is a picture of um, it's from an article that I'll um, I'll put the source to in the in the notes and so we have POTS or postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome these are all things that contribute to it now 
even though it says POTS, I want to say that dysautonomia, all these things can contribute to it. But basically, POTS can be hypovolemic, meaning that we don't have enough volume in our blood, enough water and plasma to get blood flow to all areas of the body when they need it. And so that's one problem there. Neuropathic, so neuropathic could be actually the nerves of those autonomic, uh, of the autonomic nervous system that aren't going properly to each organ or more within the brainstem that there is a, a neurological component. Immune related, so it could be autoimmune related. So basically we could be having antibodies that are binding to different receptors that are supposed to be activated or inhibited during the autonomic nervous system uh, processing. There are different neurotransmitters, acetylcholine, norepinephrine that are used. And if uh, there are antibodies that are either activating those or inhibiting those, that can really throw off that sympathetic parasympathetic balance. Uh, mast cell activation syndrome, or so basically a histamine issue uh, with the immune related component is also very common. So people that are more likely to have dysautonomia generally have histamine issues. Uh, joint hypermobility. So people that have EDS or Erlos Downlow syndrome, or even a variation of hypermobility. If joints are hypermobile, then generally the blood vessels are hypermobile, and so therefore blood vessels can't contract well enough to shunt blood where, where we want, uh, where our brain wants it to go. And so hypermobility can relate to POTS and dysautonomia. And then, then there's this form of just primary hyperadrenergic. So basically, um, there are no other issues. It's just that the individual that has POTS or has dysautonomia is releasing too much adrenaline. Um, their, whether uh, their adrenals are overactive or their brain hypothalamus to pituitary to adrenals, that system is just overactive, causing too much um, activation of the autonomic nerve, the sympathetic fight or flight nervous system. So um, that kind of concludes today's video. I know it was kind of a general overview of what dysautonomia is, but I hope this uh, gives a little bit more information for people um, who want to learn a little bit more about the brain and about dysautonomia, and then just what are the possible causes? What can actually um, have What can actually cause dysautonomia? But what uh, conditions? What predispositions can people have that um, are more likely for them to get dysautonomia from a variety of these reasons? So um, I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. If you have any suggestions for future topics, I would love to hear them. Thanks again and have a great day. Stay healthy.